Hello folks, we're in the fourth section of the chapter three of the book By What Standard, an analysis of the philosophy of Cornelius Van Til by R.J. Rushtuni. So I think that uh, without further ado, we should get to the course of mainness and do some recordings. All right. Is this it? Here we go. No, try again. Evil is the result of man's rebellion against God and is not original or ultimate. And because it is not, evil cannot be predicated of God or considered ultimate. Prior to the fall, the world and man were good and evil and error were introduced by man's rebellion. Man's fall was his attempt to become the original interpreter rather than the reinterpreter to be the ultimate instead of the proximate source of knowledge. Prior to the fall, Van Til asserts, man acted as the reinterpreter, recognizing that since he derived his being wholly and completely from an absolute God, his every act, therefore, was based on a more original and fundamental act of God. Man now must be restored to a like position, forsaking his role of original interpretation for reinterpretation, recognizing, moreover, that his consciousness is only the proximate starting point for knowledge. But man the sinner virtually insists that his present fallen and abnormal condition is the normal one and is resentful of any suggestion of abnormal mentality. As Van Til has pointed out, in the country of the blind, the man with sight was called a wild visionary. For the Christian, however, the answer is an absolute God, an absolute Bible, and absolute regeneration. The creative act and thought must be God's alone. Nothing which hints at the correlativity of God and man of eternity and time can be permitted. By such correlativity, idealism seeks to rehabilitate history, but in making historical reality exist in independence of God, it destroys the sovereignty of God and the meaning of history. Evil becomes as ultimate as the good, and history becomes an irreconcilable and meaningless conflict. History has meaning and purpose only when wholly, that is, finally determined by the personal and sovereign God. Man then moves in a personal and purposive world, and time has direction and meaning. Instead of an impersonal universe in which good and evil are equally ultimate, he moves in a completely personal universe in which his activities have meaning. Good is ultimately triumphant, and every fact is purposive in terms of a common and ultimate will. Man's reinterpretation is possible because of God's prior and absolute interpretation. History has meaning precisely because it is absolutely predestined by God. Man's activity is not mechanically determined because he lives in a completely personal environment and moves in purposive and personal history. Only as the ethical alienation of man from God is removed can man again act derivatively and constructively in the field of God's original constructive activity and re-establish the original metaphysical relationship. For Van Til, there is no underlying metaphysical separation of man from God, but rather an ethical alienation, a divorce with all the bitterness and alienation which attends such a situation. Any other conception of God makes God no more than an elder brother, setting an example for man and assisting men in their common task of trying to make sense of a senseless universe, which is the ultimate reality. For the Christian, the physical universe is explicable also in terms of the spiritual, because both have a common origin and unity in God. Quote, it follows from this that the spiritual can be truly, though symbolically expressed, by the images borrowed from the physical. It is this conception that underlies Jesus' use of parabolic teaching. The vine and the branches give metaphorical but truthful expression to the spiritual union between Jesus and his... 
That was quite a sentence. I wasn't just happy about jizz. I'll stretch my tongue for a minute. Okay, tongue stretched. Time to go. It is this conception that underlies Jesus' use of parabolic teaching. The vine and the branches give metaphorical but truthful expression to the spiritual union between Jesus and his own because the physical is created for the purpose of giving expression to the spiritual. We find then that one must first presuppose the anti-theistic conception that nature is independent of God before one can urge the argument that symbolical language is necessarily to an extent untruthful. End quote. Not only is language robbed of contents by the anti-theistic position, but man's salvation is made impossible. With any conception of autonomous man, salvation disappears. Man is not subject to the covenant and to federal representation in Christ, and hence the atonement can have no meaning for man, who becomes isolated in his autonomy and a world of brute factuality. At the same time, this autonomy of man destroys his individuality and personality in that he becomes lost in an impersonal world of brute factuality. Reality being under... Reality being ultimately an undifferentiated mass and equally good and evil... Humanity also is ultimately an undifferentiated mass, and mass man becomes a problem. In considering this subject, that was astounding. That was an astounding observation. I'm just blown away. Uh, wow. Reality being ultimately an undifferentiated mass, and equally good and bad, humanity also is ultimately an undifferentiated mass. <gasps> oh, mind blown. In considering the subject-subject relationship, the usual question is whether, under this Christian view, it is any use for the Christian theist to reason with his opponents or to seek their understanding of the Christian view of things. Since regeneration is required, of what value is philosophy? To answer this, we must again consider the problem of knowledge. That was a bit garbled. That was a bit... That was a bit... Joe Biden. I guess you can't look for the car fault. To answer this, we must again consider the problem of knowledge. All objects of knowledge in time and space, having been created by God to be truly known, must be known in relation to God. As Van Til asserts, the universals of knowledge as well as the objects of knowledge have their source in God and their relationships are in terms of the plan of God. The anti-theist, however, not only begins with the facts or objects of knowledge as ultimate, but also regards the universals as ultimate and neither has anything to do with God. No reference beyond the facts and universals is needed. If God exists, therefore, he can only be another fact, another object of knowledge, rather than the one supreme object of knowledge, the ultimate facts and the ultimate universal. With such a discrepancy between the two views, it is not surprising that each considers the other blind. But, Van Til states, the subject-subject relationship is not a problem if the subjects are Christian or if they are unregenerate. The clash comes between the two opposing groups. To answer this, Van Til feels that it must be noted first that the normal state of man is that his whole consciousness, intellect, will or emotion was created to be completely reinterpretative Reinterpretative. Reinterpret. Reinterpretative. Reinterpretative. Schwa. Schwa. Nope. Try again. Was created to be completely reinterpretative. Second, the revelation of God manifested 
everywhere in a wholly personal universe comes to the whole consciousness of man comes to the whole consciousness of man comes to the whole consciousness of man since God is absolute man is always accessible to him and can never escape his witness and truth man's alienation from God is ethical it cannot alter his metaphysical dependence on God because man is thus wholly accessible to God and resides in and is part of a completely personal universe it then follows that all creation is instrumental in terms of the dev- It then follows that all creation is instrumental in terms of the divine plan and our philosophy is also instrumental. The Christian can effectively attack every grounds the antithesis stand the antitheist. The Christian can effectively attack every ground the antitheist stands on because the Antitheist is constantly on alien and hostile ground. When he sets up his reason as judge and appeals to the laws of contradiction, law of contradiction. And appeals to the law of contradiction, he contradicts himself in that his universe is one of chance and abstract possibility and reason and the law of contradiction are thereby rendered invalid when a christian thinker like cornell declares quote, "bring on your revelation let them make peace with the law of contradiction and the facts of history and they will deserve a rational man's assent" End quote. he has set up rational man regenerate and unregenerate as the criterion and judge over god and his truth a criterion above Christianity itself, which derives from man and establishes man's ultimacy and supremacy as mind. Quote, On any but the Christian basis, man, using this reason, is a product of chance and the facts which he supposedly orders by the quote, law of contradiction, end quote, are also products of chance. Why should a law of contradiction uh, that's just a gratuitous apostrophe, uh, uh, inverted commas. Why should a law of contradiction resting on chance be better than a revolving door moving nothing out of nowhere into no place? Only on the presupposition that the self-contained God of Scripture controls all things can man know himself or anything else. But on this presupposition, the whole of his experience makes good sense. Thus, a truly Christian philosophy is the only possible philosophy. Other philosophies are or should be called such by courtesy. Those who crucify reason while worshipping it, those who kill the facts as they gather them, ought not really to be called philosophers. Insisting upon, quote, reason, end quote, as the test of truth, they have completely divorced the operation of, quote, reason, end quote, from the turmoil of fact. They cannot find coherence in anything on their principle. Fear, nothing but fear in the dark, remains. Aldous Huxley's latest novel, quote, Apes and Essence, end quote, pictures strikingly the inevitable result of a philosophy that is not a definite Christian philosophy, end quote. For the theist, the possible is the colorable. I'm going to take a drink. I can almost make out the time, not quite. For the theist, the possible is that which is according to the will and nature of the absolutely self conscious God, and God alone is the source of the possible, whereas for anti theism, the possible is the source of God, thus their concepts of possibility differ. The division between the two is not always clearly discernible because of incidental agreements. Because the non-regenerate, by virtue of common grace, have a kind of recognition, quote, of what 
Of what should be, though it is not, end quote, they come to an incidental agreement with the Christian. The agreement is incidental, Van Til demonstrates, because their consciousness gives other grounds for the, quote, fact, end quote, at hand. As Van Til has pointed out, the pragmatist agrees with the Christian in opposing murder, but for pragmatic and humanistic reasons, whereas for the Christian, the real reason is a concept of justice which has its foundation in the nature of the sovereign God. It becomes apparent at once also that they differ in their concept of justice and that their agreement is incidental, formal and abstract. Moreover, even this incidental agreement exists only with regard to things proximate rather than things ultimate. Thus, it is imperative to recognise that two types of consciousness exist and that we cannot talk about reason in the abstract. The consistently regenerate reason and the consistently unregenerate reason have fundamental presuppositions regarding the nature of reason and reality which cannot be reconciled. However, Van Til calls attention to a fundamental and general human consciousness which existed before the fall. Adam's consciousness was reinterpretive and his knowledge valid. Although the range of his knowledge could not be as comprehensive as God's, its validity did not rest on range, because he reasoned, quote, In an atmosphere of revelation, his very mind with its laws was a revelation of God. Accordingly, he would reason analogically and not univocally. He would always be pro- He would always be presupposing God in his every intellectual operation. End quote. Although man is now fallen and the unregenerate man ethically alienated from God, he can never become God and... Ah, hello, chukpapu. He can never become God as he seeks to be. He can never in reality exert the independence he claims. He remains metaphysically dependent on God. As a result, his consciousness, even in rebellion, cannot sever himself. Even in rebellion cannot sever itself from God, but retains a formal power of receptivity. Moreover, the ethical alienation is not yet complete in degree. As a result, the Christian can speak to the unregenerate. For Van Til, metaphysically, only one type of consciousness exists, one independence upon God. Ethically, two types of consciousness exist. On the basis of the one fundamental metaphysical consciousness, the subject-subject relationship is possible and effective. The unregenerate must be told that the Christian theist has the true conception of the law of contradiction, that is, quote, only that is self Only that is self-contradictory, which is contradictory to the conception of the absolute self-consciousness of God. If there were in the Trinity such a self-contradiction, There would also be, in the matter of God's revelation, there would also be, in the matter of God's relation to the world, but since the Trinity is the conception by which ultimate unity and diversity is brought into equal ultimacy, it is this conception of the Trinity which makes self contradiction impossible for God and therefore also impossible for man. Complete self-contradiction is possible only in hell, and hell is itself a self-contradiction because it feeds eternally on the negation of an absolute affirmation. Accordingly, we must hold that the position of our opponent has in reality been reduced to contradiction when it is shown to be hopelessly opposed to the Christian theistic concept of God. 
Yet in order to bring this argument as closely to the non-regenerate consciousness as we may, we must seek to show that the non-theist is self-contradictory upon his own assumptions, as well as upon the assumptions of the truth of theism, and that he cannot even be self-contradictory upon a non-theistic basis, since if he saw himself to be self-contradictory, he would be self-contradictory no longer. Now, when this method of reasoning from the impossibility of the contrary is carried out, there is really nothing more to do. We realise that if we call to mind again that if once it is seen that the conception of God is necessary for the intelligible interpretation of any fact, it will be seen that this is necessary for all facts. If one really saw that it is necessary to have God in order to have... Oh boy. Losing my mind. Losing my mind all the time. That necessary was unnecessary. Necessary. Necessary. Slurred speech. Inaccept inacceptable. So, okay, we're almost there. We're uh, four pages away from the end of the chapter. It will be seen that this is necessary for all facts. If one really saw that it is necessary to have God in order to understand the grass that grows outside his window, he would certainly come to a saving knowledge of Christ and to the knowledge of the absolute authority of the Bible. It is well to emphasize this fact because there are fundamentalists who tend to throw overboard all epistemological and metaphysical investigation and say that they will limit their activities to preaching Christ. But we see that they are not really preaching Christ unless they are preaching him for what he wants to be, namely the Christ of cosmical significance. Nor can they even long retain the soteriological significance of Christ if they forsake his cosmological significance if one allows that certain facts may be truly known apart from God in Christ, then there is no telling where the limit will be. End quote. Every claim of the anti-theist must be challenged and revealed for what it is. The agnosticism of modern thinking claims a scientific humility and reserve in the face of the unknown. But in its very assertion of agnosticism, it makes a tremendous statement about ultimate reality in that it excludes God as the ultimate fact and limits him to the possibility of being a fact among facts. All man's thinking rests on a concept of ultimate reality and agnosticism definitely excludes God as ultimate reality and allows him only the possibility of co-relativity and coexistence. To say that science makes no pronouncement about the ontological trinity is to ascribe to science a tremendous pronouncement, one which makes brute factuality the ultimate reality. A universal negative statement virtually is made with vast implications. Facts exist in a void, and nothing can be said about the void unless it is posited that some universals exist beyond the void. Thus, agnosticism cannot argue for its position without assuming far more than its position allows. Basically, as Van Til shows, it assumes the truth of the Christian theistic system in order to operate and assert itself. It is self-contradictory on Christian premises and self-contradictory on its own premises unless theism is assumed to be true. The unbeliever is thus able to think and work only on the basis of a practical reason which presupposes the Christian frame of things. On his own premises, he can know nothing, on borrowed premises, he is able to think and work, but for all his results, he remains in the paradoxical position of the cattle rustler mentioned previously. He has no knowledge on the basis of his own principles. He has valid knowledge only as a thief possesses stolen goods, as Van Til bluntly states the issue. Quote, the question is of, quote, this or nothing, end quote, the argument in favour of Christian theism must therefore seek to prove that if one is not a Christian theist, he knows nothing whatsoever as he ought to know about anything. 
The difference is not that all men alike know certain things about the finite universe and that some claim some additional knowledge while the others do not. On the contrary, the Christian theist must claim that he alone has true knowledge about cows and chickens as well as about God. He does this in no spirit of conceit because it is to himself a gift of God's grace. Nor does he deny that there is knowledge after a fashion that enables the non-theist to get along after a fashion in the world. This is the gift of God's common grace and therefore does not change the absoluteness of the distinction made about the knowledge and the ignorance of the theist and the non-theist respectively. End quote. Christian philosophy must point out that anti-theism destroys knowledge and reason and cannot exist on its own presuppositions. Quote, the autonomous man cannot forever flee back and forth between the arid mountains of timeless logic and the shoreless ocean of pure potentiality. He must at last be brought to bay. End quote. In Van Til, we have a truly Christian philosophy one based fully on the presuppositions of Christianity and doing justice to the unity and variety of human experience. Because of its Christian character, it avoids the pitfalls of rationalism and irrationalism. On the basis of the ontological trinity, a truly Christian system is developed of great and far-reaching importance. The issues raised by Van Til are to be reckoned with, and no man can claim to espouse a Christian philosophy without coming to terms with these presuppositions as outlined by Van Til. We begin this survey of Van Til's challenge to epistemology, epistemological, especially. We begin this survey of Van Til's challenge to epistemology with the story of a naked emperor. We saw that man, naked in his ethical alienation from God, seeks to clothe himself in a metaphysical independence from God. In other words, man seeks to clothe himself by robbing God and leaving him naked. But the attempt is presumption, and is a club chupa. And an impossibility and only emphasises the nakedness of man his ethical rebellion against God, and, at the same time, his total metaphysical dependence upon him. Man cannot rob God, cannot gain a metaphysical independence, and every claim to autonomy is so much, quote, emperor's clothes, end quote, a hollow pretension which only reveals more nakedly the natural man's misshapen nature. Van Til is right, therefore, when he says, in effect, as he surveys the natural man and his philosophies, that the emperor has no clothes. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. In Van Til and in Duivert, we have the clearest and most consistent formulation of the principles of Christian philosophy. Moreover, because Van Til brings to such clear focus the issues between Christian theism and anti-theism, his philosophy constitutes a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence. Isaiah 8.14 to those whose philosophic concern is to break down the offence of Christianity to the natural man. No, I have to do that again. Anti-theism. Okay. His philosophy constitutes a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence. Isaiah 8.14, to those whose philosophic concern is to break down the offence of Christianity to the natural man. God and his philosophers call attention to man's nakedness and offer him the robes of God in Christ. The compromisers insist that the natural man is fully clothed, it is only his overcoat that is lacking. This is blindness, not only concerning the natural man, but with regard to themselves and to God not only of the emperor, but also of his philosophers. It must be said, Kalapachu. Kalapachu, baba. It must be said, they have no clothes. Oh, yeah. 
teachers. I need me a teacher like um, a teacher out of uh, what was the um, Whiplash? That's it, Whiplash. <laughs> for those that have seen Whiplash, you can laugh now. <laughs> All right, thanks for tuning in. That was very stimulating. It's very rewarding to get to the end of the chapter. And yeah, thanks for tuning in. If you want to support this work, you are feel free to do so by going to nathanteacher.com and clicking on the Donate button. Donate. Donatist. Don't click on the donuts. Donuts. Click on the donate button. Okay, God bless, and hope to see you soon in the following chapter, chapter four. The psychology of religion. Integration into the void. Do void.